Welcome back to another Unity Roguelike tutorial where I'll be showing you how to implement multi tiled entities. So we're going to start off by going to the scripts folder and then into our entity folder before opening up the entity script. We're going to add three new variables, a script renderer, a vector2 int, and a vector3 array, with each being named accordingly. Script renderer, size with a default of vector2 int, 1, 1, and occupy tiles, followed by both their getters and setters. Moving down to the move method, we're going to add a new if statement with a condition of can move equals false, which passes in the direction. And we're also going to exchange the other if statement with just a simple transform.position plus equal direction with a cast of vector three. The can move method, which is relatively simple in its design, as it's a method that considers the occupied tiles, entity size, and the game's actors. Within the move method, we're also going to further make sure to update the occupied tiles 3D array by first checking if either the size X or Y components is greater than one. If so, it calls the get occupied tiles method, which calculates an entity's occupied tiles based on size and position by first instantiating a new tiles array before using a for loop. Overall, these changes add support for entities with a size greater than one by one and ensure that they can only move if their occupied tiles are not occupied by another actor or outside of the map. Now save and open the actors script. Scrolling down to the start method, we're going to exchange the add to game manager call with an if statement that has a condition that's going to check if the game manager's actors list contains this actor already. If not, it's going to add it to game manager. We're also going to add another if statement that checks the size, setting our occupied tiles to the turn of our get occupied tiles call. Lastly, as we do have a sprite renderer component now within our entity script, we're going to head down to our load state method within our actor state class, or better yet, we're going to, in the left hand bar, we're going to open up search, copy in our get components of sprite renderer, and simply replace it with sprite renderer. If you aren't using VS Code, I highly recommend that you go to each of these scripts, actor, item, fighter, inventory, and map manager, and replace them now before proceeding. Now moving on into our item script, just like within our actor script, we're now going to add an if statement that checks if the entity's list within the game manager contains the item or not, calling add to game manager if so. I just noticed the mistake in the fighter script. So opening the fighter script, you'll see here that it says just sprite renderer. This can't be so as sprite renderer is just a component. And what we're missing is a simple get component actor. All right, so we'll quickly work our way through the game manager script, where we're going to add a new system.link import, going down to our entities methods. We're going to add a new public void destroy entity method. I'll show you why a bit later, before going to our actor at location method, where we're going to make the following changes. As I've updated the method to better handle actors that occupy more than one grid cell. This is accomplished by first checking if the actor's size is greater than one in either dimension. If it is, the method will loop through the actor's occupied tiles array and check if the specified location is contained in that array. If the occupied tiles array contains a location, the actor is returned. If the actor's size is one by one, our original logic checks if the actor's position is equal to the specific location. Now I advise that you copy and paste this next method as it's going to have a tweak making sure to change the name get act at location to get actors at location. This new method has been added to return all actors that occupy a given location. This is done by looping through the actors list and checking each actors size and occupied tiles like the updated get actor at location method. The actors occupying the given location are added to a list and then returned as an array. Now making our way to the map manager script, with our map manager script open, we're going to navigate down to our create entity method. We're going to add an if and else if check to determine whether the entity is an instance of an actor or an item. If it's an instance of either, it's add to game manager method is called. Now navigating down to our set entities visibilities, where we're going to be changing our approach by determining whether the entity has a size greater than one by one. If it does, then a for each is used to check each of the tiles it occupies and if any of those tiles are contained in the player's visible tiles. If it is, it sets the is visible boolean to true. If the entity's size is one by one, it checks its position and sets the is visible variable 
based on whether its position is contained in the player's visible tiles. The visibility is then set by accessing our newly created sprite renderer property of the entity. Now we can save and open the proc gen script. With our proc gen script open, we're going to add three new monsters to our monster chances list, or I should say tuple list. The first being a slime, second a box, and the third a smaller box. The chances don't really matter as you can choose whatever you want, but for mine I chose 80 for slime, 40 for box, and 60 for smaller box. Now moving down to our generate dungeon method, or to be more specific, to where we decide where the player is going to be positioned. Currently to decide our player position, we use a while loop to keep randomly picking positions until it's found an open position. But now, we'll be using two new int variables of max attempts, which is set to 10, and attempts, which is set to 0. We're also going to be adding a 0.5 to our x and y components within our while loop. Now further explaining the changes of the code, the code will keep randomly picking positions as usual until it finds an open position, or until it reaches the maximum number of attempts. If it reaches the maximum number of attempts, the code will check if there is an actor at the current position, and if there is, it will remove that actor and then break out of the loop. We of course make sure to use the game manager's remove actor, remove entity, and destroy entity methods. Lastly, moving down to our place entities method, we're going to add a new int variable of max attempts, setting it to 10 at the top, for exchanging the code within our for each with the following. Creating a new vector2 int of entity pos with a default of vector2 int dot zero. We now preemptively create the entity for getting its components and make use of a new boolean called cam place, giving it a default or false. Much like before, the code will keep trying to place the entity in a random position until it succeeds or until it reaches the maximum number of attempts. For placing the entity for good, the code checks if the entity's size is greater than one in either the x or y direction. If it is, it places the entity at the desired position, calculates the occupied tiles, and checks if any other entity does not occupy them. If it is occupied, the code will continue to try placing the entity in a different position. So basically, if the entity can be left alone, meaning it can be placed, the cam place boolean is set to true, which proceeds to break the for loop. Otherwise, it continues to loop through all the attempts, where at the end, if cam place is still equals to false, it removes the entity. Now, technically, we've implemented our multi-tiled entities. However, we still need to work on the AI. So opening up the A star script within our compute method, we'll be creating a new temporary variable of actor actor, which is set to the condition within our if statement, along with two new checks, checking if the actor is not equal to null and the actor is not equal to get components actor, returning vector2.0 if so. Now proceeding to our AI script, we're adding a new parameter of closest tile position of type vector3 to the move along path method, followed by modifying our get position as the get position will now be obtained using said closest tile position instead of transform.position save and proceed to the hostile enemy script. Moving over to the runner AI method, and more specifically, our float of target distance, we're going to replace it with the following. This is due to the fact that before, the target distance was calculated using vector3's distant method, passing our transform.position and fighter.target transform position. However, now the target distance calculation is more complex and considers the actor's size. So, creating a new actor of actor and getting the component, keeping our float target distance variable and creating a new vector free closest tile position and setting it to the script's transform dot position. Where we proceed to check if the actor's size is greater than one by one, then the closest occupied tile of the actor to the target is found. And the distance between this closest tile and the target is calculated. For example, if the actor's size is one by one, then the target distance is calculated as in the old script. The target distance is then compared with a value of 1.5 to determine whether the target is in range for a melee attack. Now moving down, we're going to add the closest tile position to the move along path method due to our recent changes. Before proceeding to the action script for one last tweak, within the actor script's bump action method, we now have to make sure to consider the size of our actors. So we're going to create a new if statement with conditions to check if the actor's size is greater than one in either the x or y direction. We then use a for loop to check all occupied tiles of the actor 
and determine if there is another actor at the location of any of those tiles. If there is, we make a call to the melee action method, passing in our actor and target before returning false. If we proceed through the loop without returning false, then we call the movement action, passing our actor and direction before returning true. However, if the actor's size is not greater than one in either direction, then we make use of the original behavior. And with that, we're done with our scripts. Now let's go back to the Unity Editor. Heading over to the Resources folder, within each of our prefabs, we're going to set our sprite renderer by dragging our sprite renderer component into our sprite renderer variable within either our item or actor script component. Next, duplicating the orc using Control C and Control V, we're going to go ahead and double click it, rename it to slime, set its max HP and HP to 55, and its base power to two. But sadly, it's not really looking like much of a slime at the moment. And due to the fact that we are now working with multi-tiled entities, it's a bit difficult to scale our slime. So we're going to create a new 2D object of square, set its position to 0.5, and setting its scale to two. We're going to give it the S sprite for slime and set it to blue, making sure that the sorting layer is set to entity and order and layer to two. Uh, just a word of advice, 0.5 is going to be added to the square game object, or I should say sprite, transform.position.x or transform.position.y per increment to the parents, size.x or size.y. So for the case of our slime, we're going to set our size to two and y to two before removing our sprite renderer on the parent and making sure to reset our sprite renderer to our child. Now we're going to repeat this process for both the box and smaller box. By duplicating the slime, renaming it to box, opening up our box prefab, we're going to set its size to four in both the X and Y. Going into the sprite child game object, we're going to be setting its X position and Y position to 1.5 and scale to four. First scale of the course matching our size. We then from within our images, we're going to drag this box looking sprite into our sprite renderer component and recolouring it to a nice brown looking color. And of course, reducing our base power of two to zero, because in this game, the boxes don't attack. Now finally, duplicating the box, we're going to rename it to smaller box for double clicking the smaller box, setting its size to three and two, its max HP to 35 and HP to 35, proceeding into its child game object, reducing our scale X to three and Y to two, its X position to one and Y position to 0.5 before renaming it to a nice yellow. Before renaming it to a nice yellow. One last thing before we proceed to test out what we've implemented. We're going to be selecting both the box and small box using control. And we're going to remove both the hostile enemy and A star components as our boxes won't be moving. And if you wish, removing its equipment and setting its XP given to any amount. In my case, I'll be giving a zero because there's no effort needed to destroy a box except turns. Now with everything implemented, we can go ahead and test out our game. Pressing play, you will notice that the slime takes up two tiles as is intended and that it can't enter one by one tiles. Of course, the slime does still try to proceed to get to the player, but due to no AI being implemented for it to return to its original position, but we may get to that in a later video. But for now, that's it. I hope this tutorial has helped you understand the basics of creating a multi-tiled entities for your roguelike game. If you want to stay up to date with the latest updates, make sure to become a sponsor on my GitHub page, where you will have access to my sponsor only repository. And for those who want to dive deeper into the world of roguelike development, check out my open source 2D roguelike kit available on GitHub. Until next time, take it easy.